Did you know you're unique? Yeah. We have an interesting way of saying that in Jewish culture. <laughs> I know. I've got, sometimes I bring up Jewish culture and somebody goes, Oi. <laughs> they. <laughs> Oi, my God. <laughs> but every culture has unique attributes, some skill sets, some capabilities and abilities. I personally like the fact that I come from a multicultural background because I was kind of like raised in a one environment that was like, we got soul. <laughs> dude. Dude. Huh? Check it, you know. I mean, we, uh, I have soul, you know, and I was like, cool, you know. I mean, I kind of grew up in a black culture, you know, and I, I knew a lot of black people, you know, and, and we were, you know, like, rapping. We weren't like the N-word and everything else, but, you know, it was like, hey, you know, I mean, it was like, <laughs> I know, <laughs> you know, like, hey, you know, you can give a look and you go, hey, uh, you know, and you, you, you kind of know. I mean, it's just one of those things, you know, when you've been in, in a culture, you know, then, you know, American, what we call American black culture, because if you go overseas, you find that the black experience in England is completely different. Matter of fact, it's a completely different world. Or you talk to a uh, black from South Africa, like I met in Israel. Another completely different experience. And as a matter of fact, having a ethnic background doesn't mean necessarily that there are stereotypes that fit each person. Because the truth is, we're all unique. We're all distinctive. We're all created in the image of God. And that doesn't mean that because you come from an ethnic background, you're always going to be like that particular ethnicity. You know, big nose. Hey, what can I say? But the same thing is true about whether it be the Latin culture or the Mexican culture or the Argentinian. I mean, quite frankly, you don't call a Colombian a Peruvian. <laughs> no, you don't. And the same thing is true in the Middle East. I mean, there's a lot of people that say Muslim culture. And I go, well, who are you talking about? Do you know the Arab culture? Do you know what tribe they came from? Do you know what background? Do you know what family heritage? Do you realize that the quote-unquote Palestinians, you know, I mean, what do you want to call the people? I mean, after all, so what if it's called Palestinian? We don't care. Israel is Israel. Palestine is Palestine. I mean, the Palestine Post was the first paper that put out the birth of Israel. It was called the Palestine Post. <laughs> Not the Jerusalem Post. <laughs> oh well, and they're all arguing about whether to say Palestinian or not. Boy, give me a break, you know. And then they want to make it into a biblical doctrine. But the argument about, you know, that and the reality is that, hey, if you go into the Bedouin, the Bedouin are not the Jordanians. The Jordanians are not the Syrians. The Syrians are not Egyptian. Trust me, there's different cultural backgrounds and the ethnicities are very separate in that culture. That's like when I went to, uh, when I lived in Israel, I remember, you know, living in Jerusalem. I remember, you know, talking to one guy, you know, he's kind of an Arab Christian, you know, he says, yeah, you know, he says, people just don't get it. He says, you know, I'm no more a Lebanese than a Lebanese is me. You know, he says, we're, we're completely different, but you Christians just don't get it. I said, you who? <laughs> you know, and he goes, I'm sorry. You know, he says, Yeah, that's right. I'm stereotyping you because you came from America. He says, You don't act like it, but you know. I said, Well, it's kind of because I grew up in different cultures. I said, I kind of, I lived in you know the black community for a while, and then I lived in kind of like this horse country, really like you know, brain dead, horse whipping kind of culture that you know they were beating their kids with horse whips and riding horses and tearing up sidewalks in order to make, you know, room for the horses' trails. You know, I said, you know, that was kind of weird. And they even cut my hair, you know, and they, like, you know, thought all long hairs were, you know, like, you know, God knows you can't have that, you know, because they were, like, more cowboys and goat ropers than they were, like, you know, really nice people. And he was dumbfounded. He said, there's people like that in America? <laughs> I went, well, yeah. It just depends on what little pocket you find, you know. That was Norco. And then I said I grew up, you know, and then in the mountainous areas, you know, or this isolated area in Oregon where, you know, they wouldn't be caught dead talking to a Californian. You know, as a matter of fact, they were so backwater that they, you know, really thought that all handicapped people were cursed of God. I went, 
He goes, really? And I said, yeah. And then I went to Alaska where they liked everybody. Because <laughs> you needed everybody to survive. Yeah. And it was kind of like growing up in multicultural and ethnic backgrounds and multi-settings of those same ethnicities, you find out people aren't what you think they are. You don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah, you do. You look at the Bible and you say it's a Bible. So in some ways, you look at something and you evaluate what it's supposed to be, but then when you read it, you find out what it was meant to be. And that's the way the Bible is and that's the way you are. There's something true about who you are, but your life's experiences as you go through them are going to change you into the way that God wants you to be, as opposed to what you think you are or you think you were supposed to be. Because, you know, most people, they kind of like wing it and fling it, you know, and they think that they're going to make it and they take it and run with extremes. You know, they'll go from one extreme to another, you know, and jumping on that bandwagon, jumping on that bandwagon. Oh, we've got to save America, you know, we've got to homeschool everybody. Or, oh, we've got to save America. As a matter of fact, I remember this interesting thing about from a Christian perspective, born again Christian perspective. I remember when all the Christianity was, you know, like everybody was like, <clears throat> wow, everyone's a Christian. Whoa, we're all saved. And, you know, the country was Christian, you know, it was a Christian nation, supposedly, quote unquote. <clears throat> Before all this now turmoil of everybody saying, we're not a Christian, we're a post Christian nation. Oh, please, <laughs> give me a break. You know, you know, God's in control. You know, it's a God nation. God shed his grace on. God still shed his grace on. And until God quit shedding his grace on, guess what? <laughs> God shed his grace on. But <clears throat> having said that, I remember when, you know, Christians were saying, oh, well, you know, if you're a Christian home, your wife stays home. I went, wow, is that kind of like a puritanical thought? You know, my mother would have dropped dead, you know, at the thought of that because we would have starved to death. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, and it was very forceful. I mean, whether you call it focus on the family or whether you called it any other group, I remember there being a very huge push, very overwhelming, dominant statements of Christians stating, hey, you know what, you know, if you're following God, you know, your wife stay at home and that man is working. Never mind if the man can work. Never mind if the man is disabled, but, you know, all the man's got to work. Kind of like when the Baptists used to say, you know, and they were very forceful about this doctrine. <clears throat> and doctors have a way of kind of like smacking you in the face. Bam, 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 bam. And you go, whoa, what happened? I got hit with my own doctrine. Well, the Baptists used to say over and over and over again, you know, if you're divorced, you're not in the ministry. You're divorced, you're not in the ministry. You're divorced, you're not in the ministry. Charles Stanley, you're in the ministry. We'll keep you. Oops! Charles Stanley got a divorce. Ah, no! Charles Stanley, major television. Oh, boy! Charles Stanley explained what was going on. Okay, we'll say you could be in the ministry, but not, you know, the way you're in the ministry. So the Baptists had to kind of adapt to that, you know, it's kind of like, Okay, we'll change that a little bit. You know, it's kind of like the Catholics, you know, the Catholics still have this thing about divorce. You know, you can't be divorced and be in the Catholic Church. Ah, excommunicated. Well, you know, okay. You know, you know. But because of grace we're saved. Because of grace we've been brought to the place where we're at. It's grace you are saved and that not of yourself, lest any man should boast. Because once you get into that kind of righteousness, you do boast or when you try to elevate your ethnicity. You boast. As a matter of fact, you think you're black? You're back, Jack, you know, because you think you got it. You know, you think you're where it's at. Some do. Or like, you know, if you're Latino, man, you know, you drop the shorts, you know, you think like, hey, you got the bandana, you got the glasses, you know, and it used to be like, you could tell all the Latinos because guess what? They weren't called Latinos. They were called Mexicans. You know, they're Mexican-Americans, you know. And I remember lowriders, you know. Oh, yeah, we used to lowride dingle balls. You know, we got the little dingle balls, you know, used to, you know. You know, it was pretty cool in those days. Then it changed to where it's Latino. It's like, ooh, hey, I like that word, Latino. Yeah. You know, I lived in Mexico. I lived in different countries. You know, it's like, hey, you know, everybody's got their own little shtick, you know, about how they're prideful or proud of. You know, once you get into that pride symbol, you know, you got to have your colors, you know, and you got to wear this and carry that and do this and do that, you know, be this and be that. God didn't do that, you know. God said, hey, you know, 
I see faith in this Gentile, Jesus said, and I've never seen so much faith in all of Israel. You don't think there were a lot of Jews going, What? A Gentile? Saved? And he's got faith? I don't think so. You know, and yet Jesus commended him. And that's my point today, is that it's not about your ethnicity and to be prideful of where you came from, but rather it's about where you're going and who you're becoming. You see, I thank God for all the experiences I've been through. You know, I really could not relate to the people that I've been sent to unless I had gone through the things that I've been through. Now, I'll admit, a lot of what I've been through yeah, might have been my own problems or my own choices. Some of them may have been mistakes along the way. But you see, those avenues with which God allowed me to go through also gave me the opportunity to take the experience thereof and use them to reach over to another person that's going through the same thing. And that's what you can do. You see, you may have made some big boo-boos in your life. You know, some real blunders and funders and, and kind of like, you know, wonder what you're doing, you know, and people are looking at you like, who do you think you are? You know, we know where you came from. And that's what they said about Jesus. You see, it's kind of interesting that Jesus couldn't do many works, you know, in his own hometown because a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. There's a reason for that. We saw where you came from. We know where you grew up. We know how you were. Yeah, you know, you're just that carpenter's son. Don't don't go doing no miracles around here. Uh uh. Now we know who your father is. And Jesus said, Look, you have no idea who my father is. You don't even know who your father is. Because if you knew who your father was, then you would be realizing who I am, you know, and then you would know where I come from. But they didn't realize who Jesus is and where he came from. The same way that your family might be the biggest hindering block in your life sometimes. They may know where you came from, but they have no idea where you're going. Because only God can direct a life to make it into what He wants it to be, what He wants to accomplish through it. And that's the point of what we do know where all of us are going. Every single human being born of Adam and Eve, or born of Eve, I should say, Adam doesn't bear anything, you know, but born of Eve, every flesh that there is on earth, and that's what we are, is flesh and blood, will stand before God Almighty. We know we're all going there, one way or another. Now, we may be sidestepping it, so to speak, by not having to be on the great white throne judgment, because it's like, you know, when we got ready to, for our docket to be called, uh, Michael James Stone, oh, wait a minute, uh, his co case has been held over to this other court you know, the court of Jesus Christ. You know, I get to go to the judgment seat of Christ, not the judgment seat of God Almighty, you know, great white throne judgment. And that's what happens is that in this court of law that God is and God has and God said from the beginning, which is, you know, the Torah, if you want to call it that, which it's not. You know, I mean, I always hate when people use the word Torah. Torah is from the words that are used for the instructions that are told about how to be holy and because it's instructions of how to be holy, that's why Jews use it because they want to be holy. They want to get near to God, but they're not near. They're, they want to be near to God, but they don't want to be... How do we say this? From a Jewish perspective. They want to be near God, but the fear of God causes them to be far from God because if they were near to God, then the fear would cause them to fall on their face and be so terrified of the reality of God because they know that their unholiness in the presence of holiness would consume them because they know of what they're made out of, because of what they really know inside. And that's why you find the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those Herodians and those people that were in the chief priests, you know, that were in the temple at the time, rejecting Jesus. They had no problem knowing who he said he was. They know what he wanted to be and what he claimed to be, and they weren't deceived by what he said. They pretty much went, ooh, this is kind of a different way of looking at it. Man, you know, better think about that. And that's what usually Jews do, think about it for a while, you know, and they were going to argue about it. You know, and they come up to a, co a cooperative, collective decision. You know, we call that democracy in America today. As a matter of fact, the scribes and the Pharisees are a perfect example of why you don't believe in the American democratic system. That's how they came up with the wrong idea. 
Well, better to save our country than to, you know, lose our country for the sake of a few or the one. You know, better one should die than all should perish. Better the Christians should have what they want than, you know, everybody else. Here. Okay. Just saying about democracy, better be careful what you're playing with. It's the worst form of government there is. Let's vote on it. <laughs> Let's take a vote. Yeah, that worked real well in the book of Acts. <laughs> okay. Moving right along, knowing that God uniquely and distinctly created you in a certain way, as a certain image, and he had a certain plan in mind, he designed you to go in that way, to choose that day that you would come to salvation and you would know him in a realization of there being a God and that God had sent his son for you and that he would die and that he would give his life for you so that you could follow him and not you and not your words or your ideas or your thoughts. That you would turn your life over to him so that you could live his life in you, the hope of glory, so that you could accomplish the purpose you were designed to be in the first place. Now. What is your purpose? Oh, now we get to the heart of the matter. You were meant to be the temple of the living God. Wow, that's pretty holy. Holy. Yeah, you were meant to be the temple of the living God. You're a little temple wandering around, you know. Hey, temple, how's it going? Well, not many people think of it that way. Okay, I like this better. Because, you see, the temple, it sounds like, you know, you're going to be something like, you know, shiny on the outside, you know, and dirty on the inside because yeah, that's kind of what the temple was you know in the end days you know there was no like presence of God in it but the tabernacle you know the tabernacle was a tent now the temple was patterned after the tabernacle this was David's idea of what he could do in order to make God you know stay in one place rather than travel around you know be everywhere you know so David said hey you know I want to build a house for you because I got a house you know and I'm living luxury you know and I'm enjoying myself you know and boy did he enjoy himself Warning, when you start enjoying yourself, be careful. You might not be employing yourself in what God's purpose is for you. But David decided, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm kicking back. I'm living, I'm doing, I'm great, you know, and I'm, I got it. You know, and I'm like, hey, I got all this nice stuff. You know, I need to build God something, you know, so that people can all be, you know, kind of like together as one, you know. And it's like, well, that's one way of trying to put the people together, you know, stick them in a building, you know, let them all come together as one, you know. So God says, okay, well, you know, you want to build me a house, fine. You know, my, heaven is my home and this is all mine, but, you know, if you really want to do it, fine. I'll give you an object lesson that's going to teach you, you know, through the centuries, you know, about why you don't want to build a house for God. Because, you know, God dwells in the hearts and minds of men and women. He dwells in our spirit. He dwells in science. He wants to be, as he promised all along, that he would be inhabiting us. Inhabiting our praises, inhabiting our lives, inhabiting our joys, walking with us, talking with us, being intimate and real. But, you know, since they gave up on the tabernacle idea of dead badger skins on the outside, but the holiness of God on the inside and the wonder and splendor of heaven itself come inside the heart. Whoa, man, imagine that. Something dead on the outside, but live on the inside. Hmm kind of like the way we should be looking at people, you know. They may be dead on the outside, but you never know what's going on the inside. Isn't that kind of like what we started off with, book by its cover? And that's kind of why we need to realize and recognize God at work rather than men at work. Because, you see, men at work will clean up their act. You know, just kind of like I did today. You know, I kind of, I kind of put on my coat, you know. It's like, hey, you know, I got my coat. I got my t-shirt. You know, I got my sweats, it's cold out. I got my glasses. You know, I'm looking good. At least, as far as I'm concerned, I'm looking good, dude. But, God looks inside me. And he says, hey, what's going on on the inside? You know, are you hurting? Are you struggling? Are you, like, you know, like, perfect? Are you holy? Are you righteous and true? Or are you learning to use what you have been taught to help someone else? Are you laying down your life for other people? Are you giving of that with which God has given you? 
yesterday God gave you such a wonderful, powerful teaching in your churches, wherever you were at, whatever you were doing, wherever you were going, however you were worshiping, whatever way you decided to hear the Word of God. So what did you do today? Did you get up and thank Him? Did you get up and run away? Did you get up and say, hey, you know what? I'm me. I got my relationship. You're you. You're on, you're on your own, buddy. You know, I ain't following you. you. You go do your thing. Or did you get up and say, oh, God, help me to be mindful of your mind. Help me to have your heart. Help me to be my part in what you're doing with your heart in me. Have I put on the mind of Christ that I see what the Father is doing in heaven and I go, ooh, and then I look on earth and I see the same thing happening and I say, ah, oh, an opportunity today to share Jesus in a personal intimate way. I can relate to that. I have been where you are. Here's what God showed me. Let me tell you about how to get from where you are to where you can be. Let me take you the rest of the way because you're not heavy. You're my brother. Jesus said, by this shall you know my disciples indeed, in that they have love for one another. Are you caught up in some kind of like division? Are you participating in some kind of strife? Are you looking for reasons to separate yourself, you know, and make yourself holy? Hey, we're the true church. We're pompous. We're pious. We've got it. Don't lie us to us. Kind of tried it. It didn't work. And you know, that's kind of what it is. Hot air. You know, they talk a good story. And it's not that they don't walk the walk. They walk the walk. I mean, if you want to look at Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, talk to Paul. Hey, as far as the law is concerned, perfect, man. Got it. We got it. But they didn't get it. Because, you see, they left something on the outside that should have been on the inside. Perfect. And they weren't perfect on the inside. They knew it. They already knew that. I mean, it wasn't like some strange thing, you know, like, oh, well, we're the house of Shmuel, you know, or we're the house of Hillel, and we're the house of Gamaliel, and we're the house of, I'm trying to think of all the different rabbis at the time, you know, the different venues. And, you know, no, we're, as a matter of fact, we're, we're the Hellenistic Jews, you know, that have just come in. You know, we're the, we're the new party, you know, the Herodian party. No, that's the old party. That's the Sadducees. They want to hold the temple. Oh, well, we're the new party. You know, we're the, we're the guys that kind of like, you know, we got some Greek thought in here, you know, so we're going to add it to our, our, our understanding of the scriptures. You know, kind of like Philo. Oh, you don't know Philo? Philo was one of the first real big, huge Jews to bring in the Pharisaic idea that today we have in modern Judaism. You should read Philo sometime. The book called Philo is kind of interesting about how you look at the scriptures and how Jews look at the scriptures. Interesting book. Good read. Highly recommended. Most people read, you know, Josephus, which is, you know, it's kind of nice. He's a story. You know, Josephus is around. He'll tell you a lot of facts, you know, details. Some ways you'll understand it. Some ways, you know, kind of like, yeah, why not? You get something out of it, you know. There are more. Read Philo. Philo is interesting. You know? So, and it'll also give you an interesting perspective on, you know, where Christianity kind of went. You know. Yeah. And that's kind of why there's this purpose that God has when you go through your life's experiences and you discover that, hey, you know, I, I learned something from that that maybe I have something to share. Maybe I have a testimony of what I've been through that someone else will know what to do when they go through what I've been through. You get that? I mean, I love the idea that people always say, well, don't walk the walk, you know, and, or don't talk the talk unless you can walk the walk. Well, you know, that kind of puts you in a really predicament, you know, because it's kind of like, you know, you don't have to sin in order to know not to sin, but at the same time, you know, you didn't walk the walk, so how do you know that you're forgiven unless you sin, you know, and that sin abound and grace much more abound. So it's kind of like there's a purpose and a design, not really that we want, we want to kind of like really mention and go to the extreme of because we don't want to blow it out of proportion, but at the same way, if you really wanted to take that, if that was a doctrine, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk, and guess what? Hey, you know what? 
you know, if you really want to know suffering, you got to go suffer. You know, if you really want to understand, you know, forgiveness, you got to be forgiven. If you really want to understand mercy, you got to be, mer you know, you got to be applied mercy. And in some ways, that's true, sort of. But you see, God's love is such that He allows you your own choices, knowing ahead of time what you're going to choose, so that knowing you're going to blow it, He's going to let you show it. And if you're humble about it, you can open up and share even the failings of your faith with the reality of the success of God's grace. Because you see, that's where really failing comes in. Whether it's sin, whether it's temptation, whether it's trials, whether it's you blew it in front of your kids, whether you failed in front of the court of law, whether you crossed the street you know, opposite of the crosswalk, whether you went down and you cheated on your taxes, whether you went ahead and reaped what you sowed, whether you lied on whatever it may be, you demonstrated God's grace in some way. And you also paid the price. Which means you get to demonstrate in another way God's forgiveness. So, the reality of how we're living is meaning simply that we have more forgiving. I mean, not forgiving, but we have more to give. You see, forgiving can be, well, you get to give more, and it also means you get to be forgiven. You know, you're forgiven of your sins, you get to give more. Hey, if I'm forgiven my sins, then I could, you know, take that opportunity of being forgiven for that sin and turn it around and give it to someone else because they need to be forgiven. You get it? If you've been forgiven, you could forgive someone else. If you haven't been forgiven, you're going to hell. <laughs> In a nutshell. Wow, that's fast, right down the drain, you know, and there you go, you know, flushed. But that's why your life, whether from your ethnic background or your country's background or your emotional background or your devotional background, whether you were raised in the church or you're raised outside the church, whether you're raised in a faraway land or you're raised in this country, no matter where you are, the great I am has said, hey, you know, it don't matter. Because wherever you are, as you are, the way you are, I'm taking you through this life. You are experiencing it, the good and the bad, daily. You are experiencing things that no other person is going to experience or see in the same way you see it. So you have a perspective that's a little bit different, a little bit objective, but not selective in the sense of you get to choose what you use, but rather I get to inspire within you the reasons why you went through what you did so that you could touch another life with the same thing I gave you not what you interpreted. And the things that God has given us are for our benefit. You know, we're told that it's the Word of God, it's our testimony, and it's loving our lives not even unto death, but also it's our witness, our testimony, our things we have seen, things we have heard, things we have handled with our own hands. That's what really it means when you say walk the walk and talk the talk. You know, I know a guy that's full of it when he tells me what he's doing, you know, it's like, yeah, fine, you know. Some guy tells me, ah, oh, you know, I, you know, they stand up and they'll tell me all about church, you know, and they'll kind of like, you know, go, well, you know, and God's done this and God's done that, you know, and they, in front of the congregation, you know, they got this. And then, you know, I'll kind of like listen, you know, all right, you know, it's cool. And you wait a while, you know, and then they start talking about football, and they start talking about baseball, and they start talking about games, they start talking about this, they start talking about that, and you go, so what? You know, how much time do you spend with God? You know, you want to be radically extreme, but are you radically extreme? If you want to be, then be so. Don't, don't. You know, but don't say so. I mean, that's where it is. I often listen and watch and say, what I don't do, then I'm not going to say to do. But what I do do, I will do with everyone. And hey, you learn that in ministry after a while. You learn that it's more about grace than it is about your face because, you know, people will get in your face all the time and say, I thought you said, and then, you know, you prove out that you really didn't live out what you said. Or you can share your testimony, which is better because if you share your testimony, then it's what you did and what you're learning from it. And that's why we shouldn't be teaching things we don't know, but teach what we've gone through and what we can show. You get the point? 
You only tell what you know. You only talk about what you lived. You only share those things that are true for you, to you, and that you have learned and incorporated in your life. Or you sit down and say, you know, the Bible says this, but I don't know. You know, I, I'll get it. You know, I, I'm working on it, but I don't get it. You know, I'm still kind of like practicing this. I'm kind of still learning this. I'm still kind of like, you know, I, I, I'm kind of, I kind of don't have a handle on it. And you know, I was blessed recently because a pastor told me the same thing. You know, he said, hey, I don't understand. It. I went, I do, but you know, I'm glad you don't because that means that you know what, we can something, something we can share someday. You know, that doesn't mean that he's going to understand if I ever shared it because like, I have a hard time understanding it even after I share it. Like, what? I mean, I got it in my head. It doesn't mean I got it in my heart because I'm still living through it all the way from the beginning to the start to the end of the finished course of the race that I'm running with God in order to understand all that. Sometimes I have questions about it. The Lord, what else does that apply to? You know, and I want to know more. You know, I want to learn more. I want to experience more. Although the experiential part is kind of like, you know, you want to get to a place where you don't want to necessarily say that too often. You know, God might let you go through it. You don't want to do it. <laughs> oh. But... Having said that, if you have gone through it, then use what you got, don't use what you don't. That's the point we're making. You don't use, like, you know, hey, you know, you don't tell the Jews what they believe in. I'm sorry, but, you know, I've heard more Christians blow it when they start telling me what Jews believe in than I know that, you know, every Jew's going, oh, man, another Gentile idea. You know, I mean, that's reality, you know, and believe me, there's a lot of Jews don't know what they believe in. Some. <laughs> no, there's a lot in America. Most American Jews don't know what they believe in. You know, they're all messed up, you know. But if you're not part of the culture, you might not know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, it's like nice to do some research, but you know, be careful of how far you go with it. You know, it's like, you know, my wife says, those people, you know, I'm always like, well, you're a bigot. <laughs> you know, she hates that. <laughs> I'll think she'll go, those people. I go, no, those people are these people, and these people are our people, because our people are all people, and all people, believe it or not, are the same. Whether you're in your own ethnicity or whatever ethnicity you think you're in, it's all the same. Because in your own little framework, believe it or not, in your framework, you're doing the same thing that they're doing in their framework, and it's exactly the same. It's stupid. <laughs> and it is. There's no difference. There's no differentiation between Jew or Gentile, barbarian, Scythian, or free. Whether you want to say that they're blinded in part or whether you want to say that they're blessed in part, there's no difference in Christ Jesus because he's made all equal as far as sin is concerned and as far as salvation to come unto the realization of knowing Jesus Christ in a personal and intimate way by the taking thereon of his own determination of who knows him and how they serve him and what they do with him because Jesus himself will stand and say, I know you or I don't know you. And so if you take in his yoke upon you and you have learned of him and you have followed him, he'll say, yeah, I know you. you know. But he also knew Judas, so it's kind of like, hey, Judas, go do what you're supposed to do. And Judas ain't in heaven. Judas didn't make it. Judas kind of like, when Satan entered his heart, it's over. Done. Because if Satan entered his heart, there was a vacancy. And that vacancy was filled not with the Spirit of God, but with the enemy of our soul. Sad, but true. And so, when we learn to only use what we've learned, to only be what we are, to only apply what we know, then we have no fear of sharing with man what we are, or what we've done, or what we've learned. And so we stick with what we are, know, and have learned, and have applied in our lives. And John said it this way, the things which I've seen, the things which I've heard, and the things which I've handled with my own hands. And that's what in studying the Bible I like to say, you know, there's a lot of good books out there. But that doesn't mean that the books are the object of what they have seen. It means it's a descriptive of what they've learned from what they have seen. And that's why sometimes you have to let the Spirit of God take you to where He can make you into what He wants you to be so that you will minister to someone effectively. You know, it's like people will tell me, you know, well, you know, some crazy notion or some crazy idea that they might have about doing something. You know, it's like, well, all Christians should. Well, you know, you don't tell a blind man he should read the Bible. You tell him he should listen. You know, you don't tell a deaf man that he should hear the Bible. You tell him to read. I mean, 
it's applicable according to the means with which God has given them according to that measure of faith that they've been given. And so the reality of knowing that means that we gradually learn to encompass all those avenues with which God says and speaks to us of He talked to people one to one. You see, there are certain things that are true to the entire generation that He spoke to, which we know the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, you want to judge? Fine, go judge. You'll be judged. But my recommendation, don't judge. You want to be blessed? Hey, you know, poor in spirit. But, you know, you want to have problems? Be rich. How hard it is for you, you'll see. But guess what? It's harder for Camel going on with you. I mean, the reality of what he said applied to everyone, and they all knew that, and it was applicable. But then in the personal discipleship, in the personal evangelism, be sensitive to the person you're talking to, not the message you think you need to share, the message you think you have for them. Because sometimes it's not about some massive evangelism outreach, you know, where thousands of people come running forward, you know, and don't get saved, or do, depending upon how God uses it. But sometimes it's about you as the person who sees them the next day. When Satan tries to come and steal away the seed, the precious seed that has been planted in the soil of their soul, that God has said, hey, I'm going to cause it to grow, and Satan says, no, I'm not, <laughs> boom, and he steals it. Or they look at you and they say, well, what about this church? You know, and you go, oh, man, they're cult, you know, oh, they're weird, oh, they're whacked. Instead of like, well, you know, check it out. Go see what it's like. Go try it. Go be blessed by it. Go experience it. Go find out if it's good for you. If they're teaching the Word of God, you know, hey, let them enjoy it. If they're sharing Jesus, let them employ it. If they're walking according to what they know at the time they know it, let them go for it. Don't make it so absolute that you want to be the God of their salvation. Because that's where we can separate ourselves and make alienations God never intended for anyone in this generation to make. I mean, there are people I, you know, don't want to even go there, you know, with them. You know, but God knows, I'm sure, because of what they say, some people are being ministered to and some people are getting saved. And I could think of like Joel Osteen as one. I mean, he's probably one of the most frustrating people that have come along that have inherited a ministry that everyone's gone oh no you know and pushed him farthest away because he won't come out and say things about you know hell or whatever and he's kind of like you know and, you know encouraging you know and he's been pushing them and encouraging them and encouraging them and it's like it's not my servant you no know? it doesn't work for me you know, I don't have a challenge for him to be something that he's not. Nor do I have a challenge for him to be anything more than what he is. I pray for the man that God may use him as he is, the way he is, and teach him more than to be less than what he is. Because if he's called upon the name of the Lord, God will work with him. Not my cup of tea. Or Rick Warren. You know, Rick Warren is probably the most dynamic, powerful Effector, you know, as far as someone who's going to affect thousands of people in a positive way, and they're going to be discipled in magnificent ways throughout the world, and is moving behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, and all around the scenes, you know, and has already done so greatly through, you know, one of the books, but through all the other venues that God has used him, you know, and yet. I don't go to his church, you know. I'm not part of that ministry, you know. But I bless him, you know. It's like, oh man, you know, you want to learn? Hey, you're learning through Rick's ministry? Cool. God is using the man, you know. God is blessing the man. God has caused fruit to grow out of that ministry and gone on to other things. You know, we learned that a long time ago in the Jesus movement. Hopefully we did, you know. I mean, not all pastors did because they still stumble and bumble and crumble and fumble, you know, and kind of throw the ball away and take the ball and run with it and do whatever they will with it instead of, you know, just let it go where it will. And, you know, one of the things I was blessed recently hearing was that there was a pastor's conference last year about three pastors got together, and I think it was uh, Brian Broderson, Greg Laurie, and Bob Coy. And it was at a pastor's conference, and they said, hey, you know, 
this guy named Mark Driscoll, you know, I mean, hey, Mark's, Mark's Mark, you know, I mean, Mark's a cool guy, you know, Mark, yeah, he may not be part of, you know, but whatever, but, you know, hey, you know, there are things that, you know, we agree on, you know, we, we share, we do, you know, and I went, cool, you know, and they said, but, you know, they, 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 people bring up Arminianism or, you know, Calvinism, he said, well, you know, not really that, not really that, but, you know, it's kind of like, really kind of like, you know, we share on what we share on, you know, we agree on what we agree on, you know, and those things we agree, you know, and salvation, yeah. And they were talking about the essentials, you know, and those kind of things. It's like, well, you know, hey, you know, if a guy loves the Lord, I don't ask him, you know. I mean, I just love him, you know. <laughs> I'm too busy hugging him, you know, in order to worry about what they're saying, you know. I mean, it's like, you got the joy of the Lord, I got the joy of the Lord, hey, let's enjoy. That's what I always figured, you know. But in the early Jesus movement, you know, one of the things I learned, because I was in the ministry at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, was people would come from all kinds of denominations. I mean, we had nuns come, you know. And they couldn't. The nuns wouldn't go into Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa building because you know they were wearing habits. You know, so you know it was kind of you know you know they felt a little you know obtuse and obtuse you know to be going in there. But they came over to the tape lending library and checked out tapes regularly every week. You know, and always got the message. You know, it's like, hey, what am I going to say? Catholics can't be saved. <laughs> Give me a break. You wouldn't have a Bible. But the point is, is, you know, reality check. God will use you according to what he's brought you through. So, you know, don't be so shied away or run away from things you don't understand necessarily until God shows you his plan and reveals to you what he wants you to do. Because he's always going to lead you. He's always going to direct you. He's always going to let you go through some experiences so that he can use those in your life in order to touch another life, in order to love one another, in order to be loved and to love as Jesus loved you because in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. How much more so has he died for us now that we're in him than before we were ever knowing about him. If he loved us then, then he still loves us now. And if he loved us then and he loves them then, then he loves us and loves all of us now. That's why you don't change the love because you don't agree on something, but you rather let experience life and joy and employ the gift of the Holy Spirit for grace and mercy to be extended to them until the time they come to the place of the unity of the body of believers that we all will come into, that we'll all agree on. Because when you're in heaven, the one thing that's going to happen is you won't have a disagreement. You're there. You won't disagree about anything. You won't be paying attention to anything else. God will be in the center of your attention. Just read the book of Revelation. You'll realize that real fast. Everything else disappeared instantly. Because all of a sudden you were like, wow. You know, that's what happens like in a worship service, truthfully. I mean, hey, go to a concert. I mean, if you want to make a, a direct application of how God works. A person that's blessed doesn't pay attention to the rest. That's it. Bottom line. A person that is blessed doesn't pay attention to the rest. They don't care how they got it. They don't care where they got it. They don't care what they got. They just know they got it. And that's the point. A person that goes to, say, a big revival meeting, whatever. you know, Say a person goes to a healing ministry. Let's just use the worst possible example that people don't like. Healing ministry. A person goes to a healing ministry. says, hey, you know, I got a broken leg. And they walk in with a broken leg and they walk out walking. A person doesn't care about the doctrine. They don't care about the teaching. They don't care about the person. They care that their leg got healed. That's how God operates sometimes to get our attention. He moves us in ways we might not expect God to be there. Like Jacob you know, at Peniel and Jacob at Bethel. We didn't know that God was here. We didn't know God would use it. We didn't know God would be there. We didn't know what God would do. You know, And yet, he did. Because that's how God moves if we watch and see and allow God to be who He is in our lives as opposed to what we think we need for our lives. You know, every day I know there are people that, you know, like they say, hey, you know, I got to read the Bible, you know, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation. Hey, try reading something else. Try devotional. Well, no, I want to do this. You know, I'm. Dogmatism's good, you know, and I praise the Lord for people that are dogmatic, you know. If you want to read a devotional, 
read a devotional. If you want to read the Bible, read the Bible. If you've got a consistent pattern that you do, you know, one year Bible, five year Bible, three year Bible plan, all these things, I'm all happy for you. Jews have, you know, the Torah reading for the week, you know? Don't knock a guy that's reading the Torah, you know, in his Torah reading when you're reading your one year Bible plan. It's the same thing, you know? Once you get to a certain amount of grace, you realize, oh wow, you know, if it's. If it works for you, do it. You know. If it doesn't, don't do it. Bottom line. And so, I was thinking about this uh, psalm that I had uh, used all my life that I was blessed by, and I wanted to read it, you know, to share and to end in something from the Word of God, because you know sometimes I. <laughs> get carried away and it's like the Lord says and then I get up and I go you know what I forgot to share a word you know I was like you know what was, what was that all about God you know how can you have me do a video without really sharing a devotion and he's like because I said so <laughs> ah okay I got you you know and that's the separation of what doing your will versus his will sometimes is God will use you how he chooses to use you and it doesn't have to always be you know every message has a gospel you know presentation or Everything you do at work has to always be about Jesus. It doesn't hurt, but you know it doesn't have to be. Sometimes you'll talk and walk, and the people will receive from you more by your light and your life, sometimes in your words and your theology. But I did want to share something that said, you know, that I was thinking about when a brother said, you know, Romaine, as a matter of fact, said that there were a couple scriptures that applied to his life, and I said, yeah, you know, I remember. I remember mine was Psalm 118, 118, 17. And it was, when I was given some bad news, I was given some good news. The bad news was, um, you're going to die. You know, and I went, bummer. Um, but no, I was told that I would die and that I wouldn't live past 30. And so within that time frame, you know, I had gone through, you know, over a year of having to deal with this, you know, and I was pretty sure that this next surgery that I was going through was going to kill me because I wasn't in shape for it. I wasn't ready for it. They told me I wasn't going to survive it. They said it was bad, but they had to do it, you know. And so they did it, and I barely survived. But it was interesting was that before or afterwards, I think it was afterwards, because I really went through these really trials that were like massive. You know, God didn't give me a word beforehand and then take me to a trial. God gave me the trial and I went through the word afterward. But God gave me this word afterwards, you know, when I was recovering and I was really depressed. I had, you know, not postpartum depression, but I had post surgical depression that was like massive and I was really, you know, like not recovering. And so the Lord spoke to me and gave me Psalm one eighteen, seventeen, and he said, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. And that's been true all my life. I have gone places and done things that should have killed me. I mean, still to this day, you know, I'm still wondering why I'm alive. But it was because God wanted me to declare the works of the Lord, what God is doing. I said I would when I got saved. And so I do. And so I've never feared death, and I don't fear death. And I didn't fear death then, even though I was told I was going to die. It was like, well, all right, let's go home. You know, I mean, I was kind of more, you know, philosophical about it than most. And that's where I've never been so shook up by what people take up, you know, and wearying or worrying or going or being, you know, and even confronting sometimes like guns in my face or you know, gangs in my my front of me or, you know, hostility when a man's beating a woman, you know, and kind of like walking up to him and saying, you're done. Stop what you're doing. You don't want to do this. Police are on their way, you know, you're going to get arrested, you know, what are you going to do? And, you know, you got children watching. Stop what you're doing. You don't want to do this. You know, and the guy's like, you know, in my nose, you know, and I'm calm. The guy is right here. My wife watched this. She was dumbfounded. My wife was dumbfounded by this thing, but I knew I wasn't going to die. I might get my butt kicked, you know, but I wasn't worried about that either. I've been beat up before a lot. You know, but this guy was standing right in my face, you know, like when you get inside someone's space, this guy was in my nose, you know, and this is here in Sacramento. I mean, it was like one of those apartment, not this apartment complex, but another apartment complex I lived in. And I went downstairs and 
stood right there and looked him right eye to eye, nose to nose, you know. And I was calm. I was relaxed. I'd already been through these kind of confrontations where it's more of a spiritual battle, really, than a physical one. The physical is nothing, you know. Like some guy stomps you, whomps you, stabs you, hits you, kicks you. What are you going to do, you know? God says, you know, I'll heal you, walk on water, you know, I'll raise you from the dead, you know, freely receive, freely give, you know, bingo. So heal yourself, physician, so to speak. But the guy got in my face, you know, and was looking me eye to eye, nose to nose, you know, and the Lord had sent me down, so I wasn't real worried about it. And so, you know, I just calmly talked to him, you know. And he started screaming, and he was working himself up, and I watched his eyes, you know, and I looked him in the eye, and I never flinched. I didn't quit looking him in the eye. And then he said, are you eyeballing me? And I said, no, I'm looking at you, paying attention to you, listening to what you have to say. I'm also telling you that you're not going to get your wife. I'm telling you that your children are watching you. I'm telling you that the neighborhood is watching you. I'm telling you that the police are coming. I'm telling you that you don't want to do this because you don't want to go to jail. But I know that you're going to go to jail, and you know you're going to go to jail. So why are you doing this? What more do you want to do? Why do you want to be made and to look through because you're doing it to yourself. Nobody else is stopping you. I'm not stopping you from getting your wife. I'm not calling you a fool. I'm just saying, why do it? And the man knew I was a Christian, but I didn't share anything about Jesus. I just talked to him, straight up, man to man, person to person. You know, and he was a young man, frustrated, aggravated, you know, way over his limit, out of his mind from drugs and whatever else. And I never got upset. And he says, blah, 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 you know, it's still going on and venting, you know. So, you know, I took my glasses off, you know, and I said, you know, I'm not wearing glasses. You know, but, you know. He says, well, you know, he says, you know, yeah, I could kill you, I could knock you down, I could hit you. I said, yeah. I said, I'm not real worried about it, am I? <laughs> I was like, I didn't laugh, but I just looked at him in the eye. I was calm. Because he needed to know someone listened. He needed to know that someone cared. He needed to know that someone was there wasn't about necessarily the gospel, but it was about taking a stand, about standing when God says to stand, about waiting when God says to wait, and about listening when God says to listen, and letting God speak instead of you. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Not be all about the scriptures, but all about the person. And I was able to emote from inside my feelings toward this man on the outside. Oh, yeah, I'd watched him from a distance and said, you know, I hate that. I'd watched him from a distance and said, you know, I can't stand that. I'd watch him from a distance and pray for him and said, you know, I have a problem with this guy, you know, and I don't like it. But, you know, at that moment that I was standing there, I could only pour out the love that I had for him. Now, it didn't show on my face because I kept my face neutral, but inside, my heart was all for him because I knew what was going to happen to him and I knew that, you know, someday... If the Lord chooses, he will be saved. And I pray that that day has already come to him. Because he had children, and I'd seen how he loves his children. Though he had, quite frankly, beat the snot out of his wife. You know, seen that before. You know, and done what God told me to do in those cases. Some people say, well, why didn't you just lock him up and take a you know, citizen's arrest and everything else? Well, I could have. A lot of things I could have done. But what I did the Lord told me to do. And that's what you have to do. You know, there's no set automatic response button that you can press for your life in the Lord. There's no automated, you know, dogmatic routines that you can go through and say, every time this happens, I'm going to do this. You know, you can say it, but that doesn't mean you're going to do it. Because the reality of what God is taking you through it for is to be able to minister to others. And so, even if you failed, you know, and say you beat the snot out of the guy and later on felt bad about it, and then you kind of went, you know, well, what you could learn from that is you get a learning teaching on why you don't use violence to answer violence and why you allow the kingdom of heaven to be taken by force. Because you demonstrate the sacrificial love that God has for the world and its ways. And the kingdom of heaven will let violence happen to it. Because we will step back and we will stand forth and we will be just like the book of Acts. We will be those whom we will be flogged for the testimony of Jesus Christ. We will be crucified in order to witness Jesus. We will let people beat us up, stomp on us and womp on us for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Because we will be loving not our lives even unto death 
And that is the fulfillment of the scripture that says, even until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence taken by force. Because the violent will come at us. But what happens from us is the testimony that goes forth to the world is the witness of Jesus Christ who was crucified and died that we would be the light to the world and we would be the non-violent means with which we would save the world from itself and we would change the world by our testimony that we would be by the blood of the Lamb saved and that the word of our testimony would be that we love not our lives even unto death. And that's what the scripture is. So, how tight do you have your fingers clutching to the reality of your life? How clinging to you are to your guns and your ways of life, you know, and your means and your ethnicities, you know, and your wars, you know, because you're going to fight the Arabs or the Muslims or the, the Latinos or the Irish or the Catholics or, you know, the Protestants or all these different wars that have gone on in the name of God? The name of evangelism? No. You see, those aren't the way of the Lord. That's not the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven has come on earth. It's in the form of you and me. We are the reality of what you see the kingdom to be. Grace, mercy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temperance. And just like the teaching I was given last night, we ought not to obey men, but rather to follow God. And the reason why it's ought not in the English, and it may be must in some other translations, is we ought not because it's your choice. You don't have to go with what God is telling you to do. You don't have to. Really. You should do as the Spirit of God leads you. Should, as Jesus said. Ought to, as Jesus talked about. Given the opportunity by the words if, ought, should, maybe. And they are imperative, but they're imperative and optional. They're imperative in that this you do and you will be blessed, but this you don't do and you won't be. And so, in the reality of knowing these scriptures, and in the reality of going forth with the Spirit of God, what ought manner of man you to be? Rather, you should ask, what does God want me to be today? And how does God want me to see my life as a witness and a testimony of His life today?